Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to session V uh, on HCV treatment. I'm Adelina Artini. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Bristol. I'm one of the co-chairs. And my name is Masinya Koa. I work for the Ministry of Health Kenya, and I'm happy to co-chair with Adelina. Thank you. And we have six presentations, three 15-minute presentations, and then another three five-minute presentations. And I think we're going to start right away. So to start us off with our first presenter, our first presenter is Jason Grebley from the uh, Jason Grebley from the uh, Kirby Institute in Sydney, Australia. He's going to present about global available and restrictions to DAs. Uh, welcome, Jason. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and Thank you, chairs. Just wait for my presentation to come up. Beautiful. Um, <clears throat> before I begin, uh, I'd just like to pay a thanks to um, Allison Marshall. Um, Allison's uh, academic working on our group, and she couldn't be here today. And this is really, she's been leading all this work, and I'm presenting it on her behalf. So, yeah, she's done an amazing job with this program. Um, here's my disclosures. Uh, another set of acknowledgements. Um, we've we had a so first of all, our, my colleagues at um, WHO at the global and regional offices for all the connections that they put us in touch with in in country. Uh, we couldn't have done this without their support. Um, and also the global HCV and HIV treatment restrictions group, um, which is a network of over 160 uh, people globally who facilitated access to the data that I'll present. Okay, so just by way of background, um, DAs, uh, we've heard it lots at the conference, uh, with 95% cure, have, have really revolutionized HCV management. And it's actually led to population level declines in liver related morbidity and mortality. Uh, but the high list price of the DAA therapies initially led governments to actually place restrictions on the reimbursement of these medications. And um, some of the previous work that uh, we led in collaboration with, with Lynn Taylor, uh, in the United States. Um, Allison led some work in Canada, and we also did some work in, in Europe. Uh, but there's been no global um, evidence around access and reimbursement to DA therapy, so hence this review. So the aims of this study were to review the global registration status of hep C direct acting antiviral therapies, uh, to review the reimbursement of the direct acting antiviral therapies, including the, that is government reimbursed, subsidized, or uh, had a fee free policy. And then also we wanted to review the DAA res reimbursement restrictions, including on, by prescriber type, liver disease stage, drug and alcohol use, and uh, retreatment. <clears throat> so between August 2021 and October 2021, uh, we had an initial gray literature search using Google. Uh, primary data was extracted from the publicly available uh, data sources, and this include drug regulatory websites, online drug formularies, and also HCV-related documentation from national guidelines and strategies. And then we convened uh, a network of global experts, primarily HCV and HIV. And uh, we first started off using existing contacts from study authors from the paper from, that we performed in Europe. Uh, we then, uh, oh, sorry, we, we got existing HCV contacts and added in the country uh, experts from the previous review. Uh, then we went to PubMed um, and looked through the literature to find global HCV and HIV experts uh, in, from people that have peer-reviewed publications from those countries. And then, in, if we couldn't find it, we went to WHO and other UN AIDS, for example, UN AIDS, UN agencies, to get contract contacts. <clears throat> so between November uh, 2021 and July 2023, we contacted 820 collaborators, potential collaborators, I guess, uh, and we ended up getting participation from 166 uh, people globally. And this forms the Global HCV and HIV Treatment Restrictions Group. Today, I'm just presenting on the data on HCV, but there's a forthcoming paper focused on HIV as well. Um, and this helped us to extract information from 160 out of 209 countries globally, so 77%. Uh, pretty remarkable, it actually represents 95% of the global population. So between June and July 2023, then the network, we, went, we resent them the data to just validate it and to provide any updates that had happened since the initial extraction. 
Uh, just to note that low and middle income countries were defined by the OECD Development Assistance Committee list of uh, official development assistance recipients, a bit of a mouthful. Uh, the primary outcomes were registration status of the direct acting antiviral, so whether there was a generic or originator in the country, whether these uh, therapies were reimbursed, and then if there was any restrictions to accessing these reimbursed DAAs based on prescriber type, liver disease stage, drug and alcohol use, and retreatment. We collected data for um, the following DAAs, so sofosbuvir, valpatosphere, glucaprovir, preventosphere, uh, sofosbuvir, valpatosphere, voxlaprevir, uh, and then sofosbuvir alone and decladosphere. I don't expect you to see the, the table in detail. This is just to give you an indication of, of what the table looks like in, in the paper. And just to note that this work is uh, in press and has just been accepted by Lancet uh, Gastroenterology and Hepatology, so it should be uh, coming to you soon. Um, so overall, 91% of countries um, had at least one of the following uh, DAs registered. So 76 countries had sofosbuvir, valpatosphere, 46% had glucaprovir, preventosphere, 38% had soft bell vox, 43% uh, had sofosbuvir and decladosphere, and 79% had sofosbuvir alone. Um, so of the countries, 68% of the countries reimbursed at least one of one DAA. 59% um, reimbursed sofosbuvir, valpatosphere, 41% reimbursing glucaprosphere, preventosphere, uh, about a third of countries reimbursed soft valve vox, 27% uh, reimbursed soft DAC, and 45% reimbursed sofosbuvir. Um, so there was considerable variation by region, and some regions had more access than others. 100% uh, of the countries in Eastern Europe um, had access to reimbursed DAAs. Only 50% of countries in, in Central Asia, and actually only a quarter of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa had reimbursed access. Um, among low and middle income countries specifically, um, only 52% of countries had reimbursed at least one DAA. I won't go through the whole list of them uh, again, but uh, you can see the information there. Uh, this shows a map of the specialist restrictions, and the darker color is those countries with a restriction. Uh, the, and it lighter color, none stated, uh, again, lighter, no restriction, uh, dark gray, no information, and then light gray where it was not applicable. Um, so 61% of the countries had a, a special, restricted it so that only specialists could prescribe these medications. This was by far the greatest restriction in all of the different categories, um, and nearly half of these were actually from low and middle income countries. In terms of liver fibrosis stage restrictions, um, it's great to see that actually only 3% of countries now had liver fibrosis uh, disease stage requirements of greater than F1, so minimal fibrosis or higher. Um, and the countries here, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Thailand. So it's great to see considering in our previous work in Europe, there were still quite a few countries that had liver um, stage restrictions. Um, in terms of drug use restrictions, again, encouraging to see that this has come down. Only 6% of countries, including four lo low middle income countries, had drug use restrictions. Uh, I won't read out all the countries, but um, you can see them listed there. In terms of alcohol use restrictions, 5% uh, of countries, including three low middle income countries, had alcohol use restrictions. Again, uh, similar, uh, they're the similar com uh, countries to those listed in the drug use restrictions slide. Um, and then in terms of HCV retreatment restrictions, there were 7% of countries uh, that had retreatment uh, restrictions, um, and the countries are, are listed there. All right, so in conclusion, 91% uh, of countries globally had at least one direct acting antiviral therapy registered, and, and about two thirds had reimbursed at least one uh, DAA therapy. Um, this was, uh, in terms of uh, registration, this was 87% in low-middle income countries, but you can see a considerable lower proportion of people that had reimbursed DAAs in low-middle income countries, 52% compared to the 68% overall. Um, so I think this shows that there's suboptimal DAA reimbursement, particularly in these low-middle income countries. And I, I think it is important to note that the, the cost and the list price of the DAIs has come down and has become less prohibitive, but cost is still a barrier for many countries and, and uh, could be partly one of the reasons why there's still restrictions in some places. 
61% uh, of countries had a prescriber restriction, 3% had liver disease restrictions, 6% had drug use, restri use restrictions, 5% alcohol use restrictions, and 7% had retreatment restrictions. So uh, I think the, high, the findings really highlight uh, a trend that, that there are uh, restrictions that are being removed for these DAAs, uh, but more work is needed to increase global access. And I, I think a focus on removing prescriber restrictions, you know, one of the issues is, and you know, from places that have implemented uh, br a broad prescriber base, namely gen general practitioners and nurse practitioners, has been ensuring a really strong program for education and training of these providers. So I think it's uh, critical that we do have uh, increased uptake of, of education and training for pr prescribers who are non-specialists. Um, we know that data shows that, that, that the treatment outcomes are similar um, in people who are treated by non-specialists as specialists, given the simplicity of um, the new direct-acting antiviral therapies. So um, I think more work is needed. The other thing I think we should be doing is working to advocate in these countries where there's existing restrictions um, to try to work with the governments to have these restrictions removed. For example, it makes no sense to have restrictions based on drug use anymore. And I think an example of that is actually we've contacted Croatia and one of the infectious disease doctors um, is going to convene a meeting in the new year to actually discuss this uh, at a national level and to work with the government to, 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 to try to remove those restrictions. So I think if we could, if that works, um, I, I guess I would just encourage people from those countries and we could maybe work with them to try to um, develop briefs or whatnot to, to try to have those restrictions uh, removed in those countries. Um, okay, so again, just massive uh, acknowledgement. Thanks to all of the, the, the contributors. Um, it's been a real massive effort, but um, I, I hope these data are helpful for people in their advocacy uh, work. So happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jason. That was a great presentation and so much work uh, went into this. Are there any questions? Yes, please. Thanks, Jason, for, and the other co-workers for a lot of work. In Belgium, genotyping is still an issue to get reimbursement. In your, at your knowledge, do you know whether a lot of countries struggling with that? The need for genotyping to get reimbursement of DAAs? Yeah, so um, Australia has removed uh, the requirement for, for genotyping. I think a lot of countries have started, so I was trying to find it. There's Stefan. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, and, and I think a lot of other countries, it's quite interesting in Canada, what they've actually tried to do is, and in Alberta, for example, they've actually said to the labs, look, let's redirect that money that we're spending on genotyping for reflex RNA testing or, or something else. And uh, I, I just don't think it's really a requirement and we should be also advocating. We didn't look at data around the reimbursement based on genotype. It's something that might have been interesting to have included. Um, so I don't have any data for you, but I think we do have evidence of countries yeah. that have removed it and it's another thing that we probably should be pushing for. I think that that money could be um, better used elsewhere. Because it hampers outreach treatment. Absolutely, 100%. You know, if you think about moving towards single visit or near single visit point of care testing and treatment, um, the need to wait for a genotype for two weeks completely, um, you know, negates the potential benefits of such an approach. So I think it's something we should be advocating for. Thank you. No problems. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Matt Murphy uh, from the United States. Uh, the question I had is, I know the distinction between specialist um, and non-specialist hepatitis C provider is sort of a proxy for this, but I'm wondering if there's a value in also looking at where the settings in which hep C treatment is reimbursed within countries. I'm thinking specifically uh, carceral versus non-carceral community, um, primary care centers, uh, substance use treatment programs, if that might be another valuable um, sort of marker of accessibility or availability in terms of comparing um, different countries. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And I, I think I don't, I didn't quite mention this either. I think, you know, although that this shows that the restrictions are being removed in a lot of settings, I don't think that this actually represents what's happening on the ground. You know, there's still a lot of stigma, discrimination towards people who use drugs. And I think certain healthcare providers still would, you know, based on their own views are withholding therapy uh, from people based on, you know, 
various things. And I think looking by setting would be interesting. I think in the data collection for that sort of <laughs> effort probably would be pretty extensive. I think the point about prisons is really important, and I see Andrew Lloyd here, um, and, and I think that he's planning to do some work, well, we're planning to do some work uh, in collaboration around this to at least look at access in the prisons in a subset of countries. So I think that's a really important point because prisons are gonna be so critical for any elimination effort and making sure that we have access uh, to DA therapy in prisons is, is critical. Um, and it's complicated by who pays for the medication and whether it's federal, state, you know. So, yeah, really important question, I think, worth doing. One last quick uh, yeah. question, please. Um, I, I'm also curious if there's any thought around um, who's actually covered on drug plans, because I know in Canada um, a lot of people actually wouldn't be eligible for the public drug funding, much less could get reimbursed for DAAs. Yeah, I think it's a really important point, Soph. And I, I think, you know, it, it'd be really hard. The one thing that we didn't do is, you know, we didn't do things by state or by province. You know, we made a pretty generalization that if it was present, it was present. Um, you know, the US is so tricky. It's like, you know, a number of different countries. Same with Canada. You know, so if you've done some work around this. and. Um, the other thing is, is, and what's important from the work you led, Soph, is around how these drugs are actually reimbursed and how quickly you can get access to them. You know, we're not going to be able to use point-of-care testing if it takes you two weeks to get the approval for that reimbursement, and I know that's a problem in the U.S. as well. So, um, yeah, it, it's just complicated given all of the different payers and stuff. It would be tricky to, to do that, I think, in this kind of an effort, but definitely super important. Thank you very much, Jason. Great. Very Thanks, important everyone. work. So we're going to move on to our next speaker, um, Ms. Ashley King. Um, Ashley is a research coordinator with the Addiction Medicine Center of Prisma Health. With a master's in social work, Ash Ashley is focused on collaboratively working to improve health outcomes for historically medically underserved populations, including rural and people who use drugs. Welcome, Ashley. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Okay. Um, so our title is a mouthful, but um, I will be talking to you all today about our randomized controlled trial of a modified um, directly observed therapy app um, for monitoring hepatitis C treatment in nurse practitioner-led mobile clinics and other community health centers across South Carolina. Um, the study was funded by Gilead Sciences, and additional funding specifically was um, secured for uninsured patients through the South Carolina Center for Primary and Rural Health Care. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our patients, participants, and community partners who helped make this study and this program happen. Okay. Um, so in 2020, over 30 percent of South Carolina residents lived in a rural area of the state. Um, there's an estimated 406 patients per providers and very limited hepatitis C providers in rural South Carolina counties. Clinical trials have shown support for nurse practitioner-led models providing hepatitis C treatment compared to specialty and physician cohorts. And the use of mobile health clinics um, has been shown to successfully reach vulnerable populations by adaptively delivering services directly to communities in need. And finally, um, mobile Modified directly observed therapy applications have been linked to improved rates of treatment initiation and retention and care um, for t TB and HIV, but have not been studied in hepatitis C populations. Um, so while shown to be effective independently, these models have not been studied in collaboration in this setting. Um, so that's what our proposed intervention did. Um, we combined nurse practitioner-led hep C clinics based on mobile health units um, that were traveling to rural or underserved areas with an MDOT app. Okay, so here's a picture of our sprinter span size mobile unit that we did our hep C clinics from. Um, the clinics were typically staffed by one nurse practitioner and one health educator. Uh, these Clemson Rural Health mobile units partnered with community-based organizations to conduct the screenings and offer treatment while uh, Prisma Health, which is a large healthcare system in our state, um, and infectious disease physicians were available to consult and refer to as needed. Okay, so a little reference picture. Um, South Carolina is in the southeastern United States, highlighted here in the red, um, 
and then we have a zoomed in version of the state, which is broken up by regions. Um, so our work focused in the upstate region, which is highlighted here in green. Um, this region is about 11 counties, is primarily rural, and has a total population of about 1.5 million people across the region. Okay, so here we have some zoomed in maps of our upstate region, um, which is where our mobile units travel to. Um, they are outlined by zip code. Uh, the heat map on the left shows how many screenings were conducted in each zip code, while the map on the right shows the number of positive hepatitis C cases that were identified there. Um, so the red or darker areas indicate more screenings or more positives were identified, um, while the while lighter areas indicated less, and the gray areas were those zip codes that we did not travel to at all. Um, so you can see that still is a pretty significant portion of this region. Um, the colored dots here represent the different types of community-based organizations that partnered with the mobile units to conduct our screening and treatments. Um, some of these services include homeless services, food banks, and behavioral health clinics, such as methadone clinics as well. Okay, so getting into the app. Um, prior to project initiation, we worked with the app developers to create a customized experience for our patients who would be utilizing the app. Um, the main features included preloaded resources related to hepatitis C, a direct messaging feature between patient and their assigned provider, patient uploaded videos um, that the provider could then review, and side effects assessment. And then we have some screenshots here on the right um, showing what it looks like on the patient facing side. So this was a two-arm randomized control trial. Um, as you can see, we had a pretty low threshold for study eligibility, main inclusion criteria being hepatitis C antibody positive between ages 18 and 70, and main exclusion criteria being pregnant or breastfeeding. We began recruitment for the study in September 2021, enrolling only patients who were found to be hep C antibody positive through rapid point of care testing on the mobile units. Um, in February of 2022, we expanded recruitment to include additional sites um, including referrals from an outpatient recovery clinic, an inpatient addiction consult team, a linkage to care program based in emergency departments, a local syringe service program, and we actually had one online self-referral who found our trial that was listed on uh, clinicaltrials.gov. So although hep C antibody positive patients were eligible to consent, only those who had the confirmed positive viral load were actually randomized to one of the two study conditions. Um, all patients were treated with DAAs, and that was really left up to the provider's discretion of um, treatment regimen. And all study participants were invited to complete surveys at three different time points, which was before treatment initiation, um, upon treatment completion, and at time of SVR 12. Uh, these participants were be compensated $20 per study visit on a reloadable debit card um, for a total of up to $60. So the first aim of this study was to determine whether treatment initiation rates were higher among patients randomized to our MDOT treatment arm when compared with the treatment as usual conditions, um, with our hypothesis being that initiation rates would indeed be higher. Secondary aims included examining treatment completion and SVR 12 and measuring the effectiveness and feasibility of this MP-led mobile help C clinic in South Carolina. Okay, so here we have a little bit about our participants. Um, 66% enrolled identified as male, average age of enrollment was about 46, 80% um, were white, and over 95% identified as non-Hispanic. Um, a little over half of our patients were uninsured, and almost 83% had a known history of injection drug use. Um, and these don't distinguish between who was enrolled from the mobiles and who was enrolled from our other referral sources, this is just the overall. Okay. Um, so we had a total of 502 participants were screened from September 2021 to September 2022, and 146 antibody positive patients were enrolled into this study. Um, so 88 of those came from our mobile units and 58 came from our brick and mortar clinics. Um, a total of 119 participants were found to be viral load positive and were thus randomized. Um, viral load was obtained and not detected for 18 consented participants and nine participants were lost to follow up before viral labs could be obtained. Um, I would also like to note here that we became notified of five patient deaths during the course of the study. Um, none were related to study participation and our exact causes could not be confirmed. Okay, 
So 64 participants initiated treatment within three months of their study enrollment, 60.7% uh, from MDOT and about 50% of those who were enrolled from TAU. Uh, 56 of those 64 um, actually completed treatment and that was 88% from our MDOT arm and 86.7% from the TAU arm. Of those who completed treatment, a total of 28% or 28 participants um, completed SVR 12 labs within a three month window of the due date. Um, and 100% of those who obtained their SVR labs, uh, or SVR 12 labs, uh, were determined to have been cured. Um, and as you can see by some of these p-values, none of these findings were statistic statistically significant. Okay, so looking at our findings from the MDOT app intervention. Um, of the 59 individuals who were randomized to this condition, accounts could only be created for 36, and that's that first line you see there. Um, so the research coordinator was unable to create accounts for individuals who did not have a mobile phone or did not have access to data or Wi-Fi, um, and the study was unable to provide participants with cell phones. So looking down, only 11 participants, 11 of those 36 accounts that created, ever actually logged into the app even one time. Um, you can see the breakdown in usage between those who came from the mobile clinics and those who came from all of our other sources as well. Um, Again, none of these findings were statistically significant. Um, and in this last line here, you can see that of the 11 who logged into their accounts, eight actually um, clicked on some of the resources that we had provided. Okay, so altogether, these findings show low engagement with the MDOT app from our patient population. Um, many participants did not have phones with which they could engage, and for those who could, it appears that adding this extra step to their treatment regimen was not highly prioritized. However, we were able to find and diagnose many new cases of hepatitis C by meeting participants where they were at in the community. So obviously one of the major limitations to the study was the lack of reliable access to phones with data or Wi-Fi and our inability to provide phones and to our participants who are in need. Um, this made evaluating utilization of the app difficult Though the low engagement seen by participants who were able to be assigned accounts suggests that having a phone may not have greatly influenced app engagement anyway. Um, the health educator who was staffed on the mobile units with the NP would attempt to get multiple contacts for each patient. However, many were still lost to follow up, especially the, between the time of point of care testing and the confirmatory viral, lab, viral load labs, and between the end of treatment and the SVR12 labs. So we believe that having a viral load point of care testing would reduce our loss to follow up rate as well. Um, so though little impact can be attributed to, to the app, treatment initiation and completion was high in both arms, indicating that these mobile health clinics in rural settings appear to be a promising intervention for identifying and treat, treating hepatitis C in rural populations. Um, so through our implementation, we found that there is still a large administrative burden placed on both patients and providers, including uh, completion of prior authorizations, coordination of monthly medication delivery, and high uninsured rates in the non-Medicaid expansion state of South Carolina. In order to achieve the WHO goal of hepatitis C elimination, we must reduce these burdens and continue to find innovative models of care, which include MP-led mobile health clinics, um, particularly in rural settings. Uh, such models should be included as part of the United States Hepatitis C Elimination Plan, and we should continue to work to expand the reach of mobile health clinics and increase the mobile health workforce. Um, so I'll take another moment to thank all of our community and healthcare partners, as well as our funders who helped make this project happen. Um, these are some of our partners that we uh, would go and park the van in, uh, their parking lot. So uh, big shout out. and. I'll open for questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Ashley. We know that uh, we've always taken uh, randomized control trials to be highly controlled, but at least Ashley has just demonstrated that it is possible to modify some randomized control trials. So do you have questions from the audience for Ashley? Starting with Gabriel. <laughs> uh, really nice study, Ashley. Um, great job. <clears throat> um, it, was, it was really fascinating. I would have expected more of an impact um, I'm curious, in the people, have you done any qualitative work or in-depth interviews with the people who just did not want to use it to sort of understand 
from their perspective what the biggest barriers were. Um, I think it's just really important because I think it's really important to try different interventions, but then understanding sort of, you know, what, what doesn't work and why helps us to sort of think through, well, to avoid implementing intervention that might not work as well and with a similar vein. So yeah, I'm just curious, anything? Yeah, no, thanks. Um, no, we haven't done any qualitative interviews. I think that's a great next step um, and would love to understand what the differences were between the people who did engage with the app and engage with it really regularly. Um, because there were a few people who seemed to really like it. You know, they uploaded their videos every single day. Um, and then we had the majority just like out of sight, out of mind, I think was part of it. But yeah, that's a great next step. Any other questions from the audience? Thank you very much, Ashley. Thanks. And moving forward, our next presenter is um, uh, Ami. Ami is a final year PhD student at Glasgow University in Scotland. Ami studies focuses on HCV infection in the DA era, specifically exploring the lived experience of HCV infections among the people who inject drugs and the options of healthcare professionals. Welcome, Ami. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm a final year PhD student um, at Glasgow Caledonia University. And basically that means I'm tired and stressed 24 seven. Um, so today I'll be presenting some of my key findings from my PhD project, which is hep C reinfection in the DAA era, a qualitative exploration. So this uh, PhD has been fully funded by Glasgow Caledonian University. And I would like to say, first of all, a huge thank you to all of the gatekeepers within the NHS and third sector organizations who helped with recruitment and also um, took part in the study and particularly as this was done during a global pandemic. I'd also like to thank those key individuals within the four health boards um, who helped me coordinate recruitment and their services. And finally, a huge thank you to the individuals with lived and living experience for telling me their stories and trusting me to tell their stories um, through this research. So a bit of background then, um, as we've scaled up testing and treatment in Scotland, reinfection has also risen. So reinfection is incredibly important in the context of elimination and also for individuals with lived and living experience and their health care. So we know the rates of reinfection, but why is reinfection occurring? So there's very little qualitative um, data out there just now. There is no data on healthcare professionals and third sector organisations and also no exploration of the lived and, lived, lived and living experience of reinfection. So that's then where my research comes in. So I had two distinct questions. One looking to explore the lived and living experience of reinfection in the DAA era, and the other to try and gain an insight into how healthcare professionals frame reinfection, but also what we can learn from services through that. So I had nine participants with lived and living experience, and I had 13 healthcare professionals and third sector workers. So healthcare professionals I've defined as anyone who's working to um, diagnose, treat, or prevent hepatitis C. So data collection, um, it was all remote interviews, again, done during the pandemic. And for people with lived and living experience, this was done over the telephone. And for healthcare professionals, it was done via a Teams call. I collected data in four different health boards uh, within Scotland. These were Greater Glasgow and Clyde, Lanarkshire, Tayside, and Ayrshire and Arran. So my analysis method, um, for people with lived and living experience, because I was really interested in the lived and living experience of reinfection, I used interpretative phenomenological analysis. That's quite hard to say, so IPA for short. Um, and for healthcare professionals, I used a thematic analysis. So just to know, all the names in the following results are pseudonyms, and also the um, interviews were transcribed verbatim, and sometimes there might be some words or terminology that might be a wee bit upsetting for people. So for healthcare professionals, then there were five key themes, and I'm gonna give a very quick overview um, of the kind of main findings of each theme. So acknowledging the bigger picture, healthcare professionals did acknowledge that um, reinfection is very complex. It's not just a case of providing safe injection equipment, there are many more factors at play um, and it doesn't occur in a vacuum. There was also inflexibility and limitations. 
So services were restricted. This is in part due to COVID, of course, but also there was a lack of resources, a lack of funding, um, and that meant a lack of time for healthcare professionals to spend with their patients. There was also at times disjointed services, and this was very much where one service maybe had an expectation of another service, and sometimes these expectations didn't manifest as expected. A key um, positive here was the importance of partnership working. So healthcare professionals very much highlighted the importance of those key third sector organisations and how important they were and the important role they played in ensuring that individuals were getting to appointments on time and they were keeping engaged with treatment. The next theme was power and control. So the cost of DA treatment was at times being used as a form um, as a way to encourage sorry, patients to adhere to their treatment and also to try and deter, deter further reinfection. Um, healthcare professionals also highlighted that methadone, patients had kind of said to them that methadone was being used, um, particularly in co-located services, as a carrot or a stick um, in terms of trying to get them to adhere to their treatment. Seeking accountability and blame. So, Sometimes blame uh, was trying to, healthcare professionals were trying to place this blame on an event or something. They were trying to seek a kind of linear um, explanation for this reinfection. So whilst they did understand that there were many different factors for reinfection, sometimes the, the blame was being laid at the feet of their participants. So very much this was uh, blamed on a chaotic lifestyle. Patients viewed as the kind of bigger, ba biggest barrier to their um, treatment reinfection and a kind of aspect of wrong choice in the wrong day. So that was a very quick overview of healthcare professionals. And I'll now move on to people with lived and living experience. So in these interviews, people very much told their story in three kind of distinct areas. So this was before reinfection, the factors that maybe led to a reinfection event, after reinfection, and then avoiding reinfection. So before reinfection, a lot of this will be things we've already seen in the research. So environment, early life, ge geographical area, daily routine. So we can see here that Huey says, you get introduced to it, then you get deeper. The lifestyle, your attitude, it's constant. You're in that, you're in that environment, the same one you grew up in. And you're around this, the people with the same attitude as you. You want to inject, they're injecting. They're just doing the same thing, just getting by. And the same thing, the same stuff or a loop, constantly chasing the next hit. Isolation was also a key factor, and this was isolation from services, um, feeling a bit abandoned by services after treatment has concluded, but also trying to find new connections um, if you'd moved away, trying to find new people um, within your new area. Drug use was a coping mechanism, particularly during stressful times in life. And there was also self-abandonment, so sometimes individuals felt like they weren't concerned anymore with their own health and well-being, and that could lead to risky injection behaviour. So after reinfection, then, this was very much focused on stigma. So there was a lot of feeling that individuals felt that there was a change in how they were treated. This came from sometimes healthcare professionals. It also came from judgment from their peers or perceived judgment from their peers. So you can see TJ says, you can't say no when you're in company. If I was, if we were all in somebody's gaff and they were told for your hat, you've got to. If I said no, they'd be like, how's he no sharing? Does he get the virus or the hat? Or does he think we've got them? Addicts are suspicious people. We question every wee thing that's said or done to us. So to avoid suspicion, I had to take a hat and I'd just cleared my reinfection and I knew I was putting myself at risk again. But I didn't want to be singled out. You have to join in if you want to avoid, avoid suspicion. There was also this internalised stigma, and this was often amplified um, when it came to reinfection. So people with lived and living experience, they often felt a sense, sense of worthlessness, like they didn't deserve the help and the treatment that they were being given. So avoiding reinfection then, um, there was a kind of change in how people had their lifestyle, a change in how they used drugs. For some that meant not taking any drugs at all, for others it meant changing from injecting to smoking. And it also meant trying to find a routine um, within their daily life. Family were also really big motivators, and particularly children and grandchildren um, were key. So Alice says, I think it's because I'm in a better place than myself, and I'm seeing my way in things. 
I just feel that everything in my life was just kind of added up and came together. It feels nice to kind of, um, I don't know, really, I don't really know. I don't know how to explain it. But yeah, in myself, I think it is, yeah. I think in myself, everything is coming together and having the strength to do it. So the importance of networks was also highlighted as a key factor. Um, this was through healthcare professionals, so ensuring that there was that support and those networks after treatment had finished, but also through peers. So participants in this cohort were very um, positive about peers and the impact they have and how they can trust the advice of peers more at times. So commonalities across the data then. So the use of um, DA treatment is, is encouragement. It could be impacting how patients are viewing their deservedness of treatment. So if you're being reinfected and retreated and then you're reinfected again and you've been told each time how much this treatment costs, it's going to have an impact on how you feel about yourself. Both cohorts identified that reinfection is complex. There's so many different socioeconomic factors that impact. But healthcare professionals sometimes with a bit more kind of linear, looking those, for those much more linear explanations for the reinfection events. Healthcare professionals also reported a lack of resources and time. And this could be been reflected in how patients felt a bit unimportant and a wee bit isolated from services. So how can this have an, an impact in the real world? So these, these results provide a timely um, insight into reinfection and highlight that reinfection is incredibly complex in nature. People who experience a reinfection or are at risk of a reinfection really need support in key areas, whether this is how to deal with stigma if they come across it, or mental health and wellbeing, but also linkage with those key social services, so aspects such as housing, social work in terms of um, getting access to children and things like that. Service providers also need increased, increased training um, and also better resources so that they have those resources there to support um, their patients if they need to, um, whether that's through having more time, more contact with them and things like that. Um, so that is a very, very brief and very quick overview of my PhD. Uh, I'm very happy to have emails, I, you can get in touch or I can have questions just now. Thank you very much, Amy, so much work. Um, I, I really like the fact that you touched on the enablers as well, not just the barriers. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, thinking about the earlier presentations around uh, uh, prescriber restrictions to treatment, um, wh what kind of pres uh, healthcare providers did you interview and do you think that could have an impact in, in their attitudes um, towards reinfection? Yeah, so I had quite, I, I tried to get quite a broad um, spectrum of healthcare providers. So I had um, nurses, doctors, pharmacists. I also had some peer workers and individuals from third, uh, third sector. Everybody basically, as long as they worked within a service that um, worked to test, treat or prevent um, hep C, then they were eligible to be included. Okay, okay so a range of providers. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, Jason, please. Uh, really nice work. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I'm just, so I was really struck by the findings around some of the attitudes from some of the healthcare providers. And I think it, it does kind of tie to my presentation about, you know, what's actually happening on the ground. And I'm just sort of curious in terms of your thoughts of what would be required moving forward. You know, we, we're kind of saying, oh, well, you know, we don't need that much more education and training for people who around, you know, how to prescribe these medications. But it, it seems like, we actually probably do continue to maybe need some education and training around stigma, discrimination, and other aspects around the data around how effective these treatments are for people who use drugs to, tr to try to address some of those attitudes and barriers. I'm just sort of curious if you guys have thought about it and thought about interventions or within your group on, based on the findings. Yep, so that's a really valid point. Um, so healthcare providers will sometimes frame it as, or oh, you know what, I use it as encouragement to say, this is really important that you take this because it's really expensive and we really want you to do well. And some of them framed it as coming from a really good place, but I don't think that they realise the kind of impact that has on someone. Like my thing it always is, you would never say to someone who does extreme sports, the hobby, who comes in with three or four, four broken bones, this treatment's really expensive every time you come in. 
We don't say it to anybody else, so why are we saying it to people who inject drugs, people who use drugs? Why are we constantly placing that stigma back onto them? So I think there really does need to be further education, and it's okay saying, like, oh, we, all, we, know, the, we know the stigma, we know the barriers, but we're, we're, keeping on go, we're keeping on reinforcing them constantly, so there definitely needs to be some interventions. Um, I'm hoping to try and disseminate my findings and also work with key third sector organisations and organisations within the NHS to try and really get these results out there and see what we can do at a local and national level to try and get rid of this so that people feel that they can access um, DA treatment and don't feel stigmatised whilst doing so. Uh, thank you, Amy. And uh, just to echo what uh, Jason mentioned, when you talk about just training the healthcare providers, from Amy's paper, we noticed that the providers were more keen in terms of just letting the patients know uh, the importance of adherence, yet they forgot to train the patients on how they can avoid getting reinfected. So even as we train most of the providers on how to intervene for these uh, special groups of population, it's important that as we talk about uh, importance of adherence, you also talk about how can someone uh, be free from infection. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. So moving on to the five minute presentations now. So uh, the first speaker is Professor Moon, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, Moon Sung Hyu. Um, Professor Hyu is the lead biostatistician for the HERO study and Professor of Public Health Sciences at Clemson University. He's involved in observational and clinical trial studies concerning substance use disorders as the data core di director of the Addiction Medicine Center at uh, Prisma Health. Welcome. Thank you. The hepatitis C real option HERO study is a U.S. nationwide programmatic randomized trial funded by the PCORI with Dr. Arlene Medina is the overall PI who is present here. The study tested the effectiveness of two HCV care models and DOT and PN, aiming to improve treatment adherence for achieving HCV cure among people who inject drugs. The study recruited 755, uh, 755 through opioid treatment programs and community health care centers from 20 sites across the United States between September 2016 and August 2018. The map shows the United States. The study used electric blister packs to measure day-by-day -day adherence to soft-bell DAA medications for 12 weeks. The present study analyzed adherence data collected from 496 per protocol patients, and SBI is the primary outcome for the present analysis. This heat map shows the day-by-day -day adherence over 84 treatment days. The SBI failures are indicated by the, right, uh, by the hyphen marker in the right side margin, uh, which is seen to have greater number of non-adherent days towards the bottom. Based on the day-by-day -day adherence, we derive the adherence pattern variables in the table from total adherent days to second month discontinuation. Although the median adherent days were 60 day, 63 days or 75% in adherence rate, the overall SBI rate was 93%. And 29% had treatment interruption for two weeks or longer. This bar graph presents the SBI rate over the adherent day intervals. The SVR rate increased with increasing adherent days. Notably, greater than 90% SVR rate was achieved with adherence as low as 50%. This graph shows that the SVR achievers that had greater adherence rates than SVR failures across the entire treatment days. I think this tells all stories. This table shows that the all positive and negative adherence pattern variables are associated with higher and lower SPR rates, respectively. For example, greater total adherence and longer duration of medications are associated with higher SPR rate, but longer treatment interruption, first and second month treatment discontinuations are associated with lower SPR rate, with arterial ratio no greater than 0.2. Importantly, however, the greater adherence was associated with higher SPR rate, even among those who had treatment interruption for two weeks or longer. In conclusion, 
uh, people who injected drugs can be cured of HCV with greater than 80 and greater than 90 chance, even with as low as 50% adherence to DAAs. But early discontinuations and longer treatment interruptions can significantly reduce the likelihood of achieving cure. Clinicians should encourage people who ingest drugs living with HCV to adhere daily to the AAs as consistently as possible. But if any days are interrupted, to continue and complete treatment. We believe that these results are important for patients living with HCV, and clinicians, experts writing clinical guidelines, and payers. Thank you, and uh, without the uh, collaboration and the support from all these participating institutions, this, could, uh, this work could not have been done. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Hu. And uh, we just learned that uh, from your paper that uh, full adherence is not necessarily needed so, uh, for someone to achieve uh, SVR. So my question is, what are your thoughts regarding uh, shortening the treatment duration on the same? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. So, so if uh, full adherence is not a priority to achieve, uh, it's not needed to achieve SVR, what are your thoughts regarding shortening the treatment duration? Um, well, I want to refer that question to uh, the PI, Dr. Alain in, in, in uh, here, and I, I wish he can answer the, your question. I might point to Jason there, but to answer, but I, I mean, I think we know that early treatment mm -hmm. discontinuations are um, really uh, uh, adversely associated with SVR. It, um, it's 25% SVR if you discontinue in the first month, 60% you know, in the second month, and if you complete, I think it was about 97% if you went at least uh, between two and three months. So I think it's an open question um, uh, that would be very interesting to study. Um, and uh, I don't know that we can, from our data, we can say much about that. Yeah, um, we have the early discontinuation up until two, uh, two months, and up until the weeks, it's about less than 5%. So almost all participants actually did not discontinue early, but among those, uh, this continue early, we had a really low SVR rate. Um, Dr. Matt Murphy again, uh, just commend the organization of this session. Mm -hmm. um, I think particularly the prior qual work um, combined with these quant results is actually particularly helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and the question that I have, and perhaps, I'm not sure that the data that you're presenting answers it, um, but I, I work in a clinical context in a carceral setting where mm -hmm. we have limited access to SVR and viral load data frequently, mm -hmm. and we are often tasked with a very challenging um, decision of making clinical care decisions without truly knowing if someone has failed treatment or if it's been, um, if there's been a reinfection, and that does impact um, use of DAAs, you know, which or you know, which um, medical therapy we would choose, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering if you or folks from your team have uh, any insights or recommendations based on your own work for folks who are trying to um, make decisions related to treatment success with in incomplete adherence. Um, treatment failure versus potential for reinfection. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's a very important question. Actually, in our study, we have um, many who return for the SVR lab for the, the attainment of SVR, but we believe that the treatment completion is very important. And once they are completed, I mean, their SVR is very highly likely, greater than 50 or 95 percent. So we just said uh, we believe that the, the treatment and completion is really can serve as the proxy for the SVR12. Thank you. So our next presenter is uh, uh, Magdalene. Magdalene is an infectious disease consultant at the Sagreska University Hospital in Sweden. She has a PhD in infectious medicine with a dissertation on hepatitis C and fibrosis and is involved in hepatitis C treatment within the local needle exchange program. Welcome, Magdalene. Thank you. 
Uh, I would like to, to thank for the opportunity to present our data. Uh, the authors have no conflict of interest. Uh, the needle exchange programs, uh, our needle exchange programs opened in late 2018, and they are multidisciplinary care units with uh, physicians and uh, nurses specialized in infectious diseases and substance use, and we also have counselors and midwives. Uh, in two th 2019, the HCV prevalence was 48%, and 85% of the users reported amphetamine as the predominant drug. The NEPC study is a collaboration between the four um, uh, needle exchange programs in the Western region where we aim to evaluate HIV treatment with other, also other aspects of health. So, all, pa all, uh, all patients treated for HIV between 2019 and 2022 were asked to participate in the study. Uh, HIV treatment was given as standard of care with 8 to 12 weeks treatment and drug administration every 1 to 4 weeks according to patient's choice. Follow up uh, at 12 weeks post treatment as usual and then a continued follow up for 5 weeks post treatment with a regular HIV RNA tests every 3 to 6 months. Uh, 114 patients are included in the study with a median age of 42 years, 75% are male. The majority has no or mild fibrosis and only two patients had liver cirrhosis. The HIV genotype was predominantly genotype 3 and genotype 1A. And the HIV treatment drugs used were uh, sofosbuvir, velpatasvir in 60% of cases and elbasigraxoprevir in 30% uh, of cases. Uh, 113 patients started treatment and 96 completed. 84 patient, patients reached sustained viral response. We had a loss to follow up in 17 patients uh, at various stages of treatment. And uh, we had uh, six patients experienced treatment failure. Six patients were still awaiting a follow up test. And so far, we've seen five reinfections. So the SVR rate in uh, intention to treat analysis is 74%, and the reinfection rate so far is 7.3 per 100 person years. Uh, SVR was associated with older age, reinfection with time in follow-up, and loss to follow-up is associated with a younger age. So our conclusions is that the study shows high SVR rates and DAA effectiveness among people who inject drugs despite ongoing injecting drug use. Loss to follow-up is the most common cause for not achieving SVR, and continued follow-up and testing are needed to find and treat reinfections at an early stage. And I would like to end by thanking all the study participants, the staff at the Needle Exchange Program, my co-workers, and finally you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Magdalena. We have time for one quick question. In that case, um, thank you very much. We'll you. move on to the next speaker because we're running a little bit behind. So um, our final speaker is um, Christian, Christian uh, Malm, uh, who is an MD specialist in internal medicine and infectious diseases and a PhD fellow. Welcome. Thank you so much. So hello everybody, I'm Christian Mal, Malmi, you can say whatever, it's all right. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here to present this uh, study that we conducted in, uh, in Oslo. And um, so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all study participants and uh, people who inject drugs in Oslo for generously contributing to this research. And these are my disclosures. Um, the Opportunity C study was a pragmatic stepped wedge cluster randomized trial evaluating the efficacy of immediate uh, HIV treatment initiation among hospitalized people who inject drugs and it was comparing to standard of care. And 200 uh, participants were enrolled in the departments of internal medicine, addiction, and psychiatry. And when we looked at the results, we found that actually uh, more participants in the intervention group reached the primary outcome, with what, which was uh, treatment completion within six months. 
And if you look at the graph, the Kaplan live plot at the right, you also see that uh, it was um, time to treatment initiation among individuals in the intervention arm was shorter. The aims of this sub-study was to evaluate uh, SVR and assess incidence of reinfection among these participants. Um, we uh, obtained primary data retrospectively from the electronic patient files and where missing uh, data was, um, where we found missing data, we collected prospectively using point of care HCV RNA testing and all recurrent cases of HCV RNA RNA and viremia um, after uh, initiation of treatment. Uh, those cases were reviewed very carefully. And the primary outcome was the intention to treat SVR4 within two years after enrollment. Secondary outcome was incidence of reinfection. And uh, the definition used was reinfection defined as a detect detectable HCV RNA following a virologic response where the risk of reinfection was considered high during the relapse. Okay, we move on to results. If you look at the flow chart on the left, the ITT population was 200 individuals. And you see at the bottom box, 110 individuals in total reached SVR4 within two years. If you look at the orange and blue boxes top right, you'll see that uh, there were similar rates of SVR4 in the two groups. So it was not a significant difference. However, we found that time to SVR4 was shorter among intervention participants. Reasons for uh, failure to reach SVR4 was different though. We found that in the control arm, the biggest reason was that people had not been initiated on treatment. In the intervention arm, it was a higher uh, loss to follow-up. Uh, we found four cases of reinfection over a total of 103.7 person years, and that gave us an overall incidence of 3.9 per 100 person years. And <coughs> the four charts below is like one case of reinfection is one uh, graph, and you see the HCV RNA viral load drops after treatment, uh, treatment response, and then it goes right up again, and that was the reinfection and then two cases resolved spontaneously and two cases were successfully retreated. And then uh, there are two couple of my plots on the right hand side and that is time to, reinfect, uh, time to reinfection um, for participants uh, stratified by sex and age groups and actually all four cases were male and there were in, all four were in the younger age groups. So to conclude, SVR4 within two years uh, was similar among participants in the two groups. Uh, however, time to SVR was shorter among intervention participants and reinfection remains a uh, challenge among people who ingest drugs. So thank you very much. And uh, if there are any questions. Thank you very much for, for the presentation. Any questions? Uh, quick question, Alan in the United States. That was fantastic, both the parent study and this follow-up study. I know the choice of primary outcome in the parent study was treatment completion, and Dr. Hio showed that completion is a great marker for SVR, and it was impressive to see how much we're lost to follow-up in that intervention arm. Can you comment on the use of what is the appropriate kind of primary outcome now in this era of DAAs? Uh, well, um, actually, we, we used uh, final dispensation of DAAs as a, you know, as a, measure of outcome in the main study. And um, actually, if you had a final dispensation of uh, DAAs, uh, the, the rate of SVR4 was, I think it was uh, over around like estimate, like 80%. And if you added like a end of treatment response, the rate was higher. So uh, I think uh, looking ahead future, uh, using final dispension of DAAs could be used as a proxy for SVR rates, especially in marginalized populations where it's uh, difficult to find and test people. Okay, thank you very much. And this concludes our session. Um, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to everyone for coming and enjoy your lunch.